Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Welcome to this very special Monday edition of the show where we're going to be continually talking about conservatism within the province of Alberta. On episode 401, we had uh, the former member of parliament, Jeff Watson, on the show. We talked about uh, conservatism and the federal leadership race. I want to dive into a little bit deeper in episode 406, which you're listening to right now, with our good friend of the show who's been on once before, Mr. Spencer Bennett. Spencer, thank you so much for doing this. It's going to be fun next hour talking about conservatism, but also the UCP leadership race. Hey, happy to help, Chris. So uh, I, I guess the first question, I, 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 I'm going to throw this out here, but I want to start with the million dollar question. What is conservatism to you, Spencer? <sighs> That's a good question. I think that the definition has evolved over time. Um, to me, then it means getting good value for your money, um, you know, fiscal responsibility. But but what does that really mean these days? Um, I think it come it means coming up with pragmatic, realistic solutions um, to problems. Um, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a hard question to define. I think it's getting harder and harder to, um, to I mean, I can tell you what it's, what it's not. Um, well, so what is it not? Because uh, when uh, over the last few weeks, over the last two weeks, we've had some candidates who are running for the UCP leadership on, and uh, we have a few more coming out later on this month as well. And I've asked that question to them. And the definition that they give is relatively what you just said, fiscal conservative, a little bit more socially progressive, but still within that uh, conservative mindset. And they're all giving their different answers, and I am finding it fascinating. While they're different wording and different ways that they're looking at conservatism, they do leave out some things that I, I, I look at and go, oh, you, you don't talk about more uh, the social issues that are happening, homelessness and all that. So in your words, what, is, what isn't a conservative in 2022? So... I, I, I was thinking a little bit more about what is a conservative, and you typically hear things, and I agree with um, empowering individuals, teaching people how to fish instead of giving them a fish, um, coming up with programs that um, that can actually, um, you know, make a difference in communities rather than some of the virtue signaling or um, what's the word, wokeism that we see. Um, and so I think that what, yeah. It's a I mean, hard question. Conservatism is, and it, is, it, is not socialism. No, exactly. But what's socialism, right? Exactly. And like that. it's it's so hard to define a question like that, but I always like to ask that because it gives me an insight and gives my listeners an insight on who you are, but also what your where you stand in the conservative spectrum of things, because there's no one answer for conservatism, I, I agree, I, I believe, right? Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, and, and with evolving um, values over time, too, then um, then we have to define, um, you know, I think conservatism needs to change, too. Um, you can include some environmentalism and, and other advocacy and, you know, helping marginalized communities. Um, and I think that can certainly be a part of the picture of conservatism as well. The reason I asked that question, not only just to get a little bit more insight for to, for me, for you, but also my listeners, but the UCP, the United Conservative Party here in the province of Alberta, are currently within a leadership race. And there has been some talk on the Twitter sphere, and I know you should never believe what Twitter is all about because it's a microcosm of our society and it's an echo chamber of who you follow and that's about it. But the UCP is in a defining moment today. It's in a moment when we're trying to define what a United Conservative Party member, a United Conservative Party government, a United Conservative Party uh, leader looks like. And we have a vast, a vast, I have more than I thought there would ever be, but here we are, we're 10 candidates in as of recording this, 10 candidates in and we are still trying to figure out what conservative conservatism means within the province of Alberta. Do you believe this leadership race here in the province of Alberta is going to define what conservatism means within the province for years to come if a candidate is chosen from the more populist spectrum or the more centrist or the more traditional uh, sounding word of conservatism? Um, I would... 
I would say I hope so in the sense that I hope that we get a premier that can stick around and last at least a full term. <laughs> we don't have a very good track record of, um, of having premiers that, that stick around. Um, and I think that I would hope that in the future leader that we find, we can find somebody that's a little bit more compassionate, a little bit more humble. Um, you know, people, I think, weren't upset with Jason Kenney over, you know, the billion dollars lost on a pipeline or some of those things. It was like the Sky Palace and his tone and hypocrisy and, you know, arrogance, those types of things. So I think that a leader um, can make wrong policy choices, but it's their um, real or perceived um, arrogance and um, attitudes that, that is ultimately what sinks them from Redford Sky Palace to Jim Prentice look in the mirror, now Jason Kenney. Um, so above all, we need a, a candidate that's probably boring, vanilla, you know, can, can hold the ship uh, and be humble enough. And so I would hope that they would define conservatism for the future because I hope that we get a, um, a candidate that fits those things. I, I feel like if it's Brian Jean or Danielle Smith, they will likely stick around for, you know, maybe a half a term and probably won't last because they're um, arrogant and <laughs> populist and come up with ideas that really aren't practical and aren't really solutions at all. They're just good at rallying people and getting people angry and without presenting real solutions. Um, but if it's one of the more centrist candidates, I think that they could have a good chance of sticking around a long time. Well, and this is why I wanted to bring you on, because I, I want to dive into this this leadership race and the candidates, because we, we are bringing them on. We're trying to bring in on all 10 candidates or as many as the, uh, want to come on and talk uh, talk to us about their campaign. But I, I, I will be honest, I am relatively newer to Alberta than some traditional people who have been here their lifetime. I am. Uh, I haven't covered politics for a long time, and I, I in Alberta, I, like you, talked to me about the conservative movement in Ontario. I can go on two hours for that. So I want to bring people on like yourself and try to digest who these people are. And I want to start with the two that you mentioned first because I think they're the most well known of the two of the ten candidates that have currently announced. That is Brian Jean and Danielle Smith, two former Wild Rose leaders have announced that they're running for the leadership of the Conservative Party. I want to start with the big name because I think she is the perceived uh, Wild Rose front runner, And I say that as she is the name brand that most people know, but she has the Wild Rose backing, I would assume, or she might not because of something worth talking about in a few seconds. But in your opinion, what are the strengths and the weaknesses that Danielle Smith brings to this leadership race? Well, I think that the strengths um, is that she speaks a lot of populism, uh, and that's a strength and a weakness. It's a strength that it rallies people and can fundraise and get people out to vote, but it's a weakness in the fact that a lot of it is just baloney. Um, I've been struggling with the term populism because to me populism means you say what's popular at, at its root. Maybe that's right or wrong. Say what the people want to hear. Um, but I would define populism. I, th I think that in that sense, populism is a good thing, but you actually do, do want to know what people, you know, what are your needs? What are your concerns and how can I address those? But in the Danielle Smith of populism, it's saying absolute baloney that doesn't actually solve any problems. So like the Alberta sovereignty act, which says we're not going to um, follow any rules that Ottawa tells us that we don't think fits in Alberta's best interest is just baloney. Like it's not, credible it's not realistic but it gets people fired up you know if you put out some of those those commercials then you'll get a lot of money that's rebel media populism um which has half truths um covered with emotion and rhetoric that you know fires up average rural um you know potentially non-educated um folks but it's not a long-term successful strategy I want to. I want to. I want to ask you about this because you talk about populism and getting the the base fired up. It seems like, and this is this is an outsider's perspective looking in. Danielle Smith is taking a lot of uh, pages out of the Pierre Polyev playbook in this leadership sure. race. You got the same title, uh, like Danielle Smith for Premier, Pierre Polyev for Prime Minister. You have the social media videos that she's pumping out. It seems like she's going after the same base that Pierre is rallying up. Is is that a fair and accurate uh, assumption? 
I'd say that you're right. Um, and I use, I know this is mostly about provincial, but, and I used to be, you know, Pierre somewhat supporter and probably he was going to be my vote. But as I've listened to him more and more, the amount of silly things that he says um, has drifted me away. And, you know, people like Sheree are looking a little bit more attractive because I feel like more moderate, more vanilla, but will actually govern more reasonably than, than just saying stupid things all the time, like Bitcoin can combat inflation and, and things like that that just are not realistic and will not lead, lead to long-term success. Why is, why is that such term, a driving factor, though? Why is that such a appeal to so many people? Is it because, is it the Donald Trump factor in some sense? The We don't feel like we've been heard by the mainstream politicians, the politicians that we elect, the Jason Kennys, the Ed Stelmax, the Rachel Notley's. So if you're going to talk my language, I'm going to listen to you. But if you're going to talk to me like I'm a voter and not a uh, actual like your boss then i'm not going to actually listen to you i'm going to listen to the person who talks to me like a person and not like a voter yeah i know 100 percent um and i think that if you look at um any um like social media whether that be twitter facebook whatever the cartoons and the memes get shared far more than like the trevor tomb here's a well-balanced articulate opinion uh, the nuances involved with whatever issue, unfortunately, don't get read or studied or understood very much. Um, and so I think that water tends to follow the path of least resistance. And I think that media is following the path of least resistance, or at least social media, where people tend to um, look for over simplistic answers that are not accurate. And I think the left is also guilty of this sometimes too. Um, not just a right wing thing, but I think that um, um, unfortunately, it's led to a less educated, more emotional, um, voter base that um, tends to make decisions that aren't going to be in their best interest. We talked about the pros that Daniel Smith and the somewhat, somewhat of the cons that Daniel Smith, whether it be the populist movement with social media, with talking about things that people rally around. But the one thing that a lot of people, and I see this from conservatives, and I've had conservatives off the record tell me that we like Danielle Smith, what she's saying. We don't like what Danielle Smith did in 2014 when she crossed the floor. And is that still a factor with Danielle Smith? Do people still hold it against her? Do you think that once you show your true colors of crossing the floor and joining another party, when you are potentially going to be the next leader of the next premier of the province in 2015, if you would have stayed in the Wild Rose? Or are people over that now and just saying, okay, we've moved past it. She's done her uh, a penance. She's gone away from politics. She's come back. She's realized her mistakes. She's said her mistakes and she's moving forward. No, I think a lot of people haven't forgiven her yet. They, uh, traitors may be too strong of a word, but those, those feelings of, uh, you know, we had this wild rose thing and then she, she betrayed us. She betrayed our trust and crossed over without um, at least not transparent consultation. Um, my understanding is that behind the scenes, a lot of her um, MLAs were going to jump ship anyways. And it, she was maybe not forced to, but it was, you know, um, certainly not as simple as uh, just waking up one morning and deciding to, to cross floor. So there's certainly a little bit of nuance there. But um, I think that, uh, yeah, I think that a lot of folks still don't trust her from from that floor crossing. The next one I want to talk about is Brian Jean. Brian Jean, yet again, another former Wild Rose leader. He was the runner up in the 2017 leadership race with uh, Jason Kenney becoming the first one. Um, he's taken another kick at the can and he made it, he hasn't made it a secret that he, that's the only reason he got back into politics is because he wanted to take back control of the UCP and bring it back to where it was. What's your thoughts on Brian Jean? What's his pros in this leadership race and what's his cons, do you think? So I think that Brian Jean has been sniping at Jason Kenney for the past two years. I don't know how many times he said that he should resign. Sometimes, you know, perhaps accurately, but other times it's just the outrage du jour, like you see on Twitter sometimes. Um, and I don't think that Brian Jean has done anything to help the conservative movement in the past two years. I think he's He's fired up the populist base with unrealistic, unscientific ideas based on COVID or restrictions. He recently said something like, you know, we recognize the, the, you know, thousands of deaths from COVID and also the many deaths caused by the vaccine. Did you hear that? Yeah, I, I, I saw that old uh, debate and I cringed at the tenor of the debate. Let's put it that way. 
And, uh, you know, it's like certainly lockdown had a lot of negative impacts, um, you know, whether that be deaths or violence or, you know, unemployment or whatever the case may be. But but to say that um, the vaccine caused hundreds of deaths or things like that. But I think that was on point for Brian Jean. Like, I wasn't surprised when he said it, even if and I don't know, maybe a dozen folks. I have no idea. Well, but it's a maybe a hundred across the world might have died from the vaccine, but hundreds of people die from day to day drug uh like over the counter drugs as well so it is a right. symptom of our society like you cannot be 100% guaranteed on anything and no trust me i i know that uh you you have to sort of just take the good with the bad sometimes but understandable it did piss off a lot of people when he said that but i the context is where it needs to come from, but Brian Jean just didn't give context and it just didn't sit well with no. a lot of people. And, and like I heard um, Stephen Carter say this on uh, the, the strategist and it wrote through me, I'd heard it before, but it said that he who holds the knife shouldn't wear the throne. And Brian Jean has been stabbing in the back for the past two years. Um, and I think in my opinion, uh, I'm not saying that he should be disqualified by the party, but that disqualifies my vote and my support because he has um, not helped the conservative cause. He's been given, you know, um, giving us black eyes for the past two years and and uh, trying to present unrealistic solutions that, um, you know, I'd use the term populism again. One of the things, and I, 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 I want to get your opinion on this is, I went to a few rallies in the last few weeks with uh, leadership races, and there's one as of recording tonight that I'm going to be going to in Calgary with uh, Canada. We're going to be talking about it here in a few minutes. But mm -hmm. I, I, I speak to some of the other supporters, right? The Ahir supporters, the uh, Schultz supporters, and the uh, say, uh, Sawan, Asani supporters. And the thing I hear is we can't elect Brian Jean because we don't know how long he's going to stay around for it. He came into politics, he resigned federally. He came into provincial politics, he resigned provincially. He came in again. Is he going to stay around if we don't elect him? Is he going to stay with us? Is that a factor? Do people actually talk like this? Or is it just the other side just trying to get supporters on their own team? No, I'd say it's 100% a factor. Um, he was an MP, then an MLA, leader of the Wild Rose. And then when he lost the leadership, then he packed his bags and went home. And I think that there could have been a place at the table for him had he chosen to be a little more reasonable and had he chosen to, um, you know, to seek re-election. Um, but I think that it was, uh, you know, back to that pride and arrogance thing that I think is the downfall of many politicians. But I think that that, that hurt him. Um, and I, I'm in a, a little bit of a unique position because I worked in the legislature for a year and I have door knocked with about a dozen UCP either candidates or MLAs, you know, on the past election. So I know a lot of the staffers, a lot of the folks behind the scenes, um, and not a lot of people have respect for Brian Jean anymore. Um, and uh, not a lot of people, um, he comes from a lot of wealth as well, um, which is you know neither a good nor bad thing, but sometimes it can change your work ethic as opposed to somebody that, um, you know, uh, is working really hard for every, every dollar that they have to make. I, I thank you for that. Uh, those two, I'm going to be watching. and We've reached out to their campaigns. Uh, uh, Brian Jean's team has gotten back to us to say that he will appear on the show. We just have to get a date. Daniel Smith, if you're listening to this or anyone on their team, please reach out to us and we'd love to have her on as well. Uh, the next, I want to start talking about more of the established UCP, the ones who have been here for some time. And I want to start with the big man, the Minister of Finance, Mr. Travis Taves. Um, he is perceived to be the front runner because he has a lot of caucus endorsements right now. I think the last time I checked, he was at 25 uh, with himself because a few others have joined, if I'm not mistaken, since his launch in Calgary. Um, so before we get started, uh, Minister of Finance, until just recently, he brought in the surplus. Uh, what's your pros and cons about Travis Taves, Taves if I'm pronouncing so, his name right? Full disclosure, I worked in Travis Taves' office for a year in the legislature, like at the beginning of, of the UCP's term. Um, and I have nothing but respect for the man. He's He is humble. He is compassionate. He took care of his staff. And it tells a lot about a person, how they... Um, treat people that are quote unquote under them, you know, how they treat the janitor, how they treat 
you know, the admin staff, um, how they treat their supporting staff. Uh, and he treated all of us like gold. Um, there was a lot of turnover at the ledge. Sometimes it was due to ministers, quite frankly, being jerks. <laughs> um, but that was never the case with Travis. Um, you know, there was some turnover, but it was usually because they're going to the premier's office or going to other places. But um, he held a pretty consistent line. He treated any civil servant. We met with civil servants all the time and stakeholders from a range of different places. And he treated them all with respect and dignity and took the time to listen. Um, so I think, number one, that's a good thing. A lot of folks are going to compare Travis Taves to Jason Kenney. Um, I've heard it already said, you know, oh, Kenny 2.0, just what we need, another old white guy. And he is an old white guy, but there's some big differences between the two. Um, so Jason Kenney has a half of a divinity degree um, from university. So he didn't even finish a degree. He maybe has two years. Um, Travis Taves has, a, like he's a chartered professional accountant. Um, I think he has an MBA as well. I'm not sure, but he's, he's very um, educated, so he can fit in great with the white collar crowd. Um, Jason Kenney, you know, this is neither a good nor a bad thing, but has never been married, doesn't have a family. Um, actually, to be frank, I don't think that is a good thing. I think that it's good to have some sort of family and connection or a spouse that can build, it gives you a lot more sympathy and empathy. Um, Travis Taves uh, and Kim, his wife, are, Kim is amazing. I've met all of the family and they're all super humble, hardworking folks. Kim's a, a public school teacher. Um, so having a public school teacher being, you know, married to your finance minister or to your premier, I think it's a good thing because it brings that empathy and the importance of public education. Um, and Travis have, has 11 grandkids too. Um, so it's, a lot more empathy and a lot more compassion than than Jason Kenney, who's been his whole life in politics. Um, Travis Taves was the president of the Cattlemen's Association too during mad cow disease. So you remember when mad cow disease was ravaging Alberta and Ralph yeah. Klein said, shoot shovel and shut up. And it really hurt our ag industry. But Travis Taves was the president of the Cattlemen's Association, was able to bring some closure and solutions to that. Um, so he's uh, he's far different in his background, education, family, He's a uh, old white guy, so is the premier, and I think that's where the difference is. I think that's, um, I think that's that, where that's, the similarities lie. Is just that he's old; they're both old and white. That's about it. <laughs> you know, man. I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, um, but like okay. I was saved. So I'm gonna I'm gonna push back here because I, I want to okay. ask the question yeah. that I've been hearing. Understandable that you've been hearing about the Jason Kennedy two point oh. I've been hearing it as well. The, 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 the reason behind that, and this is just from my perspective and what I've been hearing from people who I've been talking to at these events, like I said, I go to these events, I talk to people, is mm. he has the backing of caucus. He has the backing yeah. of the caucus that literally backed Jason Kenney to win. Yeah. And Albertans are concerned that if we elect this guy, while they might be different background wise, they were all in the same caucus. They were all there. We might need someone who hasn't been there for some time or who is going to be a little bit different from Jason Kenney because Jason Kenney and Travis Travis Taves were basically side by side the entire last three years because Minister of Finance and yeah. Premier are going to be buddy buddy for them uh, for during a COVID during uh, their time in office. Mm -hmm. With so much caucus endorsement, is that a negative? Do people look at that and go, I, I like Travis, I like that he's humble, but if caucus is supporting him, are we just going to get what we just had with Jason Kenny, a disorganized, dysfunctional uh, next two years and lead up to Rachel Notley? And I just want to ask that honest question because I think there's a lot of people out there who are thinking that right now. And for someone who knows them, do you think Travis's leadership, while being different backgrounds, would be completely different than what we've seen? And he would run a more unified, party moving into the next election so premier kenny is very driven by ideology um he's been in politics a long time and he has um almost like a philosophical take of how things should occur why and how and is very read up on lots of books um and has lots of those things whereas travis um he told me that five years ago he had no interest in politics until in his words, the NDP started ruining Alberta and then he decided to get involved in politics, but he's not driven by ideology as much. Um, your point about um, the caucus supporting both uh, and how is that going to work? I think that could be a positive or a negative. 
because it gives the perception that he's the um, established candidate. And if you want the same old, same old, this is what you're going to get. Um, whereas uh, the anti-establishment folks, uh, whether that be um, Brian Jean or Danielle Smith, um, or Ross Sherman, we, we we gotta forget. We can't forget Ross Sherman here. He's there a go. not there go, Ross. <laughs> It's true. Yeah, or that mayor of Colville or whatever his name Bill is. Bill Rock. But, uh, <laughs> Bill Rock. Right on. Um, so I think that there's certainly pros and cons to having the backing of caucus, but um, it could prove to be a liability. I think that folks on caucus. Do people um, care? Do people Travis care about caucus runner? endorsements? <sighs> like when I, you're talking to your yeah. conservative friends up in uh, Spruce Grove, Stony Plain area. Are people saying, oh, I, I'm really going to endorse uh, Travis Taves because he has the backing of, I'm just going to pick Martin Long. Like, so is I that- think it depends on the relationship that the MLA has with their constituents. Okay. Um, so in Spruce Grove, Cyril Turton's my MLA, and he was a city councillor for three terms. I'm good friends with Cyril. And he's generally well-liked among most people here. So I think that in his case, because he's well-established, like I went door knocking with him and... Um, Every time we would go out, he'd probably know a half a dozen people by name and by face at the door. So he does have good brand recognition and knows the community well. Um, but if somebody like, and I don't know Martin Long's background, he's a nice guy, but I don't know. It was the first name that pulled up that I was on the list of uh, endorsements. That's the first one I saw. Uh, but understand. But like a Pat Wren or, or somebody like that, you know. Um, <laughs> but I think that. Pat I ran up in Lesser folks, Slave Lake, probably not a good endorsement in that riding. Just, just being being honest on that one. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that some MLAs jumped on the Travis Taves boat because they wanted to have a good position because they thought Travis is going to win and they want to be in a good position for the next election. Um, so I think and that it's potential the, cabinet material, right? Like you, you back the exactly. horse, you might get a cabinet position, and that's just just like you have some. Go ahead. You have some reasonable MLAs that are backing Pierre for the same reason. They may disagree with a lot of what Pierre is doing, but they back, they think the right horse so they can be in a good position to be in cabinet next time. Uh, awesome. Um, so thank you for talking about Travis. But I want to talk about, uh, because just for timing's sake, I want to try and lump the next three in together. And I mean this mm. with no disrespect to the three candidates because I think they all bring something to the table. And that's Leela here, Rebecca Schultz, and Rajon Sani. Rajan, Rajan Sani, sorry, I keep on pronouncing that wrong. I literally had her on the show last week, and I for, I pronounced it wrong twice. So, Rajan, uh, Rebecca, and Leela, three women, yeah. three cabinet ministers. Leela was turf from cabinet last July. Uh, Rebecca was the minister of children's services. Uh, Miss Sani was the minister of transportation before stepping down and running for this leadership race. All three from Calgary area. It seems like we have a very large Calgary contingent besides Mr. Taves um, and Mr. Uh, Lowen and Mr. Gene. But those three, are they factors in this leadership race or are they running to be a better in a better cabinet position? Um, I think that, uh, so Rajon, I was surprised. Um, um, Ken Bosenkul is backing Rajon, and I have a lot of respect, a lot of time for Ken. He's, mm-hmm. I think, one of the future thinkers of conservatism. If you were to ask him what's conservatism, he'd give you a very good answer. And, um, you know, I consider him somewhat of a friend. And and uh, when I've read his position papers and stuff, they all make sense. And I think that that's the future of conservatism. So I think that having Ken on her team is, a, is certainly an asset for sure. Um, but I was really surprised to see Angela Pitt at her um, uh, launch. Because she well. seems to be the wild, rosy, anti-establishment type, um, but she seems to be running more of a left-leaning, centrist campaign. Um, and I think that that's a good campaign, but the Angela Pitt just threw me off a little bit. So maybe um, she'll get, maybe she'll be the number three if Brian Jean and Danielle Smith, or you know, maybe that was to draw some of that crowd. I'm not sure, but that surprised me. Um, Rebecca, Rebecca Schultz is. Yeah, Rebecca's great. Um, I worked across from her at the ledge. I printed off Paw Patrol posters for her kids that would sometimes <laughs> run the halls on the ledge. Um, super sweet. Um, you know, very well spoken, very um, compassionate. Um, I think she'd probably be my number two. 
Um, I think that where I struggle with Rebecca is her lack of um, background in leadership. Um, so she has a comms background. Uh, she used to work comms for the Saskatchewan government, for the executive council. That's how she knows Brad Wall. But she doesn't, in my experience, have the proven background to lead people and to lead initiatives like a Travis Taves um, or maybe even a Rajan would. So her, to me, her lack of experience um, you know, speaks to that. But I've really liked uh, Rebecca's campaign. I think it's been optimistic, solutions-based, um, and I think that, you know, both her and Rajan have been running great campaigns so far. And just, just on Rajan's, uh, uh, I, I was at the Airdrie event. There was a few people there, but she brought out people in Northeast Calgary. I, I was very shocked. There was about seven, it was the largest event I had ever seen for a UCP candidate since covering the UCP leadership. So it was her backyard. So I'm not sure if that was what that was all about, but, um, I give her credit and she knows her base. She knows her base and she knows where she go goes to. Uh, with Rebecca, it was a small intimate gathering down in Calgary Shaw. Uh, I was not shocked that Pierre Polyev's mother was there and brother uh, Pierre's brother was there. So I'm not sure if that's a subtle hint that the Pierre machine is going to be backing them or it looks like it's going to be backing them because uh, Councillor Dan McLean, who is Ward 13 here in Calgary, he was there as well. He introduced her. So it things are lining up and Brad Wall famously endorsed her, endorsed her as well and Rona Ambrose as well. So she has yeah. more of the established uh, the big names, I should say, right? The names that people go, oh, wow, like Rona Ambrose endorsed her, a, uh, uh, Brad Wall, Tim McMillan, former Lloyd Minster MLA, president of the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers endorsed her. So they, these are big names that are coming out and I give her credit. She knows her win and she has the like she has some caucus endorsements, not a lot, but some caucus endorsements that are getting behind her as well. So she's one that I'm going to be watching. I, I'm not sure where she lies in the grand scheme on the first ballot but she is one that i'm watching the one i want and i think that go ahead. Um, just really quick i think that you're going to see like the ranked ballot throws throws kind of everything into a blender but if you have danielle smith and brian jean getting each other's sloppy seconds per se um then i think that you'll the other camp is going to be the taves Schultz, and rajon camp um, and so whichever one of those falls off, the support will likely fall to the other folks. Um, so I'm supporting, uh, I mean, not really, but I'm encouraged by, by Schultz and Sani uh, in hoping that um, if they don't become premier, that their votes will roll off the tapes. Because I think that any of those three would be, are, are my top picks right now. I'm very surprised, very surprised that... We have two other candidates that we're going to talk about here in a few seconds, but I'm very surprised that the candidates are very much non-confrontational at this stage of game. Because right now, you I know you want to sell memberships, and after the memberships are sold, then you start attacking. We see that with the federal campaign. You say, you need to put me number two because we need to stop this person, this person, this person. Do you think that this campaign is going to take a nasty turn that we are seeing with the federal campaign? Or do you think because you are government, the UCP is government right now, it's going to be more uh, optimism and uh, hope and positive over the next few months until October? I think that you'll see the two camps going after each other in terms of the two camps being the anti-establishment and the establishment camp. So I think that you may see Danielle or Brian taking pot shots at Travis, the perceived, and I think the front runner. Um, and so I think that he's going to, it's, I think it's his to lose. And I think in the debate, people are going to be picking on, on him just as they do in any debate, they pick on the perceived, like at the um, CPC race in Edmonton, everybody picked on Pierre because he's the perceived front runner. Um, so I think that you'll be seeing that, but between, um, the Schultz and Rajan camp, uh, Rajan Sani and, and Rebecca Schultz camp and um, Leela's camp, I don't think you'll be seeing too much fighting, nor nor with the Taves camp. I think um, Taves has said a few times that he really wants to change the tone. Um, and to be frank, I think part of the reason why the Premier lost um, was because a lot of his communications was overly abrasive. Um, and I would hope and I think that Travis Taves is going to be cleaning camp with some of the communications folks to have a more compassionate, reasonable approach. And so I don't, 
imagine that um, he'll be too attack attacky um, unless it's against the populist camp, but I don't see him going after uh, his fellow ministers or former ministers. Uh, the last one we were going to talk about, but we we kind of just kept on talking about Rebecca and Narajan is uh, Leela here, uh, former mm-hmm. member, former minister of culture, uh, status of women, uh, MLA for Chestermere Strathmore, uh, was very vocal about Jason Kenney resigning last year during the Sky Palace event. Um, are you shocked that she's in because she's in a challenging uh, nomination battle herself for her own seat for the UCP? She has a challenger. Are you shocked that uh, the candidate, uh, Miss Ahir, is in this race? Um, Leela is a wonderful person. Um, I've spent time at her home, um, you know, got to know her and her husband and her family really good, very musical, wonderful family. Um, but I would have similar concerns as I do with Rebecca Schultz in that I don't know whether she has had experience in leadership to be able to, um, to be able to lead uh, a party or, or lead a province ultimately. Um, I think that would be my reservation with her. I, you know, her morals are good. She's super kind and compassionate, can be fiery sometimes, but I think that that's, that's a good thing. Um, Sarah Biggs is, is running her campaign and Sarah Biggs is very, very sharp as well. Um, but I think that that race is going to get a little too crowded and she'll have a hard time getting all the money and signatures that she needs to, especially without a lot of um, support from other MLAs or some of the Calgary organizers that some of these other candidates have. And just for transparency's sake, because you gave transparency about Travis Taves, uh, Sarah Biggs is a contributor to the show. She comes on each Wednesday for Point of Order, our live Wednesday night episode. Um, so just for transparency's sake, and a little bit more transparency, because we always like transparency on the show, Ken Bossacool and Sarah Biggs and Spencer and myself have had occasionally played poker on regular Friday nights. Uh, you might have seen some uh, tweets from uh, some people saying that we're, we're raising money for nonprofit organizations. So we do play on a regular, not every time, everyone plays at the same time, but we have had the occasion where we have played with Ken and Sarah and Spencer and myself and a few other people from across Alberta. So just for transparency's sake, that's on the table there. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the last three and the last three are kind of unknowns to me and I kind of don't know what to think. That is Todd Lowen. Actually, last four, because there's one that's announced and I'm going to his leadership launch today in Calgary uh, as of recording this. Todd Lowen, Raj Sherman, the former progressive conservative uh, associate minister of health, turned Lib- Alberta liberal leader. Bill Rock, the mayor of Amisk, Alberta, which is near Hardesty, Alberta, which anyone knows that's where Keystone XL pipeline was supposed to start. And the one who just announced today, which I have no idea who he is, I think he worked for ATB, I could be wrong, is John Horseman. So we have four, and I'm very politically observant, and I try to follow these things as much as possible. Besides Raj Sherman and Todd Lowen, I don't know who the other two are. Like, did you know who Todd Hors- uh, uh, John Horseman and Bill Rock were before this leadership announcement? No, no. And I think that... Um... In many of these cases, perhaps they're launching leadership to raise their profile a little bit so they can springboard this, this to other things. Um, is Lowen trying to get back into thing. caucus? Is that what this is about? Do you think that's what this is about, him trying to get back into caucus? I feel like there's better ways for him to do that. <laughs> I don't know if he's very politically astute. He's a trapper by trade. Like He runs a trapping company up north. Um, and he's like a redneck, like I think... He would. I don't know if he brought his smoker to the ledge, but he certainly brought a lot of smoked meat, cooked waffles for people, down to earth, um, blue collar, nice guy, but not very politically astute, and certainly doesn't have the support that maybe he thinks that he has in order to get the signatures and and money. Um, I'd be surprised if I bet I bet we'll only see about a half a dozen people um, that can get the signatures and the money and make it past that, that cutoff. But I certainly don't see rock or Sherman or Holmstrom or, or Todd making that list. Well, we have to remember Sherman's not even a, like, not even allowed to run. He did not get the waiver to run. This is the Dr. Raj Sherman. He was the liberal leader. He donated to the Alberta party. He has not, uh, gotten a waiver from the party because he did not hold a UCP membership for more than six months prior to this leadership uh, launch. So he's running basically to say, I'm going to get the money, I'm going to get the signatures, and they're going to have to let me run 
Well, no, they don't, Raj. And I uh, don't get me wrong. We'd still love to have you on to talk about why you think this is possible. But am, am I out to creak to say this is a pipe dream for Raj Sherman? Like he wants to get 100%. back in the arena or he's going to run for the nomination in Calgary, like center or Edmonton center for the UCP in the next election. It just seems very weird to me. Right. Yeah. Edmonton. Like, yeah. I, I don't understand what his end goal is. Like I've wondered sometimes with candidates, whether they're running for council or mayor or whatever, and they don't stand a chance in hell, but maybe they want to build brand recognition so that they can further their business, their political careers, whatever the case may be. Um, and I think that if we didn't have some credible center leaning, left leaning, I'd say center leaning, I don't know if any of the candidates are left leaning per se, but centrist candidates, then maybe he'd be a reasonable alternative. But um, with uh, Schultz and Sonny um, and, and Leela, like I don't see, um, I don't see where Sherman's going to fit in the mix. Um, as far as like Rock and Lowen, the anti-establishment type, sorry, that camp's taken by Danielle and Brian. I have like, there's no way they're going um, the, the to feel more that, momentum. The only thing that differs between Rock and Smith, in my opinion, and just this is through interviews I've heard, is Rock is for separation. He wants to separate. He is right, riding that train to this elect, in this election is uh, separate from Canada and we want to become our own province. And uh, whether uh, Brian Jean be more, we want more autonomy from Ottawa with uh, uh uh, Daniel Smith being, we want to be more sovereign from Ottawa, which I do, still don't really know what the difference between sovereignty and autonomy is, because it's basically we want more rights, which kind of the same thing. But if you want to have the Alberta Sovereignty Act, go for it, Daniel Smith. I This leadership race and these four candidates that we're talking about, they're, they're running on certain issues, but they're not running a credible... And I say that with all respect because I don't know John Horseman. I'm going to attend. He might be a credible. He might be a centrist. He might be someone who has some great policies. Until I know that, I'm not. I'm. I'm just going to have to assume. And I know we're recording this after uh, recording this before the event, so I don't know. Um, the three Sherman, uh, Lowen, and Rock. It seems like they're just tr- like you said. They're trying to raise their profile. Do you think they're going to raise the 175000 to be part of this campaign or the two that are actually potentially going to be on the ballot? I think that if, if Lowen or Rock were to do it, it would be by tapping into the rebel media populist crowd. Um, so what happens if then, they do? What if happens if they actually do? Like, does that say something about the conservative movement in this province where you are so fractured where you don't know... Like you have people in the conservative movement who are for separation, who are for uh, the populist movement, who are for autonomy, for uh, sovereignty, who are just mainstream conservatives. Is, is that what it tells Albertans that anyone's welcome? Yeah, I think that that's it's hard because certainly among the left a wing, you have it's fractured as well um, with the extreme environmentalist or radical anti pipeline people falling off bridges versus the more centrist left as well. So I. I think that there is a real divide, but Alberta, we basically have a two party system, just like in the States, you're Republican or you're Democrat. And here I feel like, um, and I'm oversimplifying, um, but I don't see the Alberta party gaining a lot of traction. So I think you're either a conservative or you're a new Democrat in Alberta. It's it's oversimplified, but those are the two alternatives to choose from. Um, I'm worried though, that if like Todd Lowen got in and say he gets 500 votes, I'd, he'd be lucky if he did. But his number twos then are going to Danielle Smith and Brian Jean. Um, but is he going to be attracting people to vote that they're not already? Uh, in other words, is he going to be gaining, is he going to be making the pie any bigger? Or is he just going to be chopping up the populist pie into, into a smaller piece for him? Um, th- does that make sense? It does. Like, it I does. don't know what. The down ballots. The, where does Where does his supporters go and how much of his supporters actually just go in to vote for Todd and that's it. Because you have to remember it, while it being a ranked ballot, you don't have to vote for every single candidate. You don't have to put one through 10 on, you can put one through three. And after the third ballot, if your person's not on the ballot anymore, it it's done and you're over with and your supporters don't go anywhere. So it's going to be interesting to see where his, how his pie or how the pies for each of these campaigns get divvied up on that second if no one reaches that magic 50%, which I don't think anyone's going to. No, I don't think anybody will reach 50%. I think, uh, 
I think that we may even see an unlikely, like I think that that's why like a Schulz or Sani stands a potentially credible chance so long as you don't dislike them too much and they can be your number two and number three. Um, that's how Ed Stalmet got in and Ray, um, Allison Redford. Redford got in, right? And even, you know, debatably O'Toole was, was a lot of people's third choice, but he was able to sneak in that way too. And Sheer. Um, Sheer, yeah. Maxine was the supporter everyone wanted and then Sheer came up behind. But I, That's right. The, the last question before we start to wrap up here, Spencer, uh, is Jason Ken- Kenny famously said on uh, on uh, on his leadership review night in I think it was May 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 tenth or something like that whatever day it was that fifty one percent plus one was no longer fifty one point four percent was no longer a credible number to stay on as leader of the the Conservative Party of, of the United Conservative Party. I've asked this to our, my group of friends. I've asked this to a few conservatives and they look at me and they, they, they have to second guess themselves. So, so I'm going to ask you, if the leader, the next leader of this party, the winner of this, uh, this uh, ranked ballot system gets 51.4% or anything less than 51.4%, are they credible enough to stay on as leader and focus the party going forward. If it's not good for Jason Kenney to get 51.4% and stay on as leader, does the next leader of the conservative movement, the United Conservative Party, need to get more than 51.4% to be a established leader? Or if they're even close to that 51.4%, is there still going to be this fractured party that we are seeing under Jason Kenney? Now, is that 51.4% of first ballot or third ballot? 51.4% 51.4% on whatever ballot. If it's less than 51.4%, is it credible for them to keep the party together? Say if on the seventh ballot, the candidate has 51.4%. And it might go to seventh ballots. We don't know until we know on what the ballot looks like. We don't know if it's going to be four ballots, three ballots, two ballots, eight ballots. I don't know. So if the if the ballot, if the final total is 51.4% on that last ballot, whatever ballot that is, is that a strong enough mandate to keep the party unified going into the next election? Um, I I don't know what choice they have. Like I wouldn't <laughs> call for them to resign and then have a new election where we only vote for three people and hopefully they get a higher percentage, you know? Um, so I think that it presents a challenge for them and they need to identify. So if, if Brian Jean, and I hope he doesn't win, but I, if Brian Jean or Danielle Smith won, then they need to understand that they, okay, they've got the anti-establishment crowd. Maybe they need to reach some all branches out to the centrist folks. Um, if it's the, you know, the other folks that win, then, you know, to know where their strengths and where their weaknesses are. Um, but I think at the end of the day, then we need a leader that can appeal to all Albertans. Um, and so if we have a Taves or Sani or Schultz that wins, um, and they only have 51% of the conservative votes, but they can capture a greater amount of um, the hearts and minds of general Albertans, and I think that they're okay. Um, so I think there's a difference between a conservative leadership race or conservative leadership review in a general election. I think that these folks will have a chance to prove themselves and to win the hearts and minds of, of all Albertans, not just the narrow conservative base. So. Oh. The last question I'm going to th- uh, pose to you here, and you can take a few seconds to listen to the, uh, to think about it, but I, I'm going to ask you three questions, and I want their names if you can. I want to know who the perceived front runner is in your mind, who the dark horse in this leadership race is, like the one that you're watching, but you're not sure where they're going to fall in this whole grand scheme of things. And who's the underdog? Who's the one that you're watching and going, okay, you could potentially win this if you, if everything falls into place for you, but it's not going to happen unless X, Y, and Z happens. So who's your front runner, perceived front runner? I'm assuming I already know who that is because you've said transparency's sake, but who's your front runner? Who's the dark horse? Who's the one that you're watching that could potentially spoil the party for your front runner? And who's the underdog that could win, but only if things fall in line for them? So I think that uh, Rock is the front runner. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Taves is the front runner because um, he has the support of Caucus and a lot of the support of, of, I think that what's underestimated and maybe under discussed is the role of organizers. Like if a lot of Calgary organizers and Edmonton organizers get behind a candidate, 
they can rally support and get money and signatures really quickly. And Taves, with the first one to hand is his signature and his whole money and his, his thing is ready to rock and roll. Um, and then I think that, um, I think Dark that Horse? the Dark Horse, I'd either put Schultz or Rajan. I, I haven't decided between the two who's going to be higher, um, you know, who's my number two. But I think that there's a path for victory for either one of those two. Um, if and they're not going to get it on the first or second or maybe even third ballots. Um, I don't know if Taves is going to win on the first, second or third ballot either, but having a ranked ballot system sure can change this. And I think that, um, like I listened to the strategists and Stephen Carter talked about um, uh, the mayor of Calgary, um, Jody Giontuck, and how yeah. she was able to rise from like number five to number one, just by having a consistent, clear message and not saying stupid things. <laughs> um, so I think that if if the candidates say stupid things, whether that be Travis or or Brian Jean or Danielle Smith, then you can have a, a Rajan or Rebecca kind of pull forward. And same thing, if, if either one of those comes across as prideful or says or does stupid things, then they can also fall off very quickly as well. So. And the third, who's the one that you're watching the underdog of this whole story? The one that the Rudy of the story, the one that wants to play all the time, but finally gets to play at the end of the movie when everyone gives their jersey in and say, put them on the field. Who's that underdog for you? Am I cheering for this underdog? No, you don't have to cheer, but the one that you're going, okay, if things fall in line, this could potentially happen. I mean, I would, I, I, I think that it could be could be Schultz um, because I think that if things line up, um, yeah, I, I don't know the difference between underdog and dark horse. I guess dark horse like, is the one that the, that is a credible second choice. Is a credible second choice. The underdog to me is the one that you know what. No matter what, they're in it for vanity. But if things line up, because we've seen weirder things, we've seen Joe Clark, the Joe Who movement in 79, and he was the underdog that no one expected to win. The dark horse in that race was Brian Mulroney. John Crosby was the front runner. That's what I mean by underdog. The underdog that everything has to fall in line for them to win. And for me, for me, that would be Alila here. Like okay, she, yeah. she is a credible candidate. Don't get me wrong. But yeah. there's a lot of obstacles that she needs to overcome before she even gets considered to be on that ballot for that first or second choice. So she is the underdog. The dark horse for me, like you said, is Asani and Schultz. And the perceived front runner, I'm going to say two, is Smith and Tapes. Those two yeah. are the perceived front runners. The dark horse to me, though, the, the, the underdog is if things happen, I hear could potentially win this. I, I, I know it's a long shot, but it could happen. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you there. I think that a lot of things would have to go right. Um, she being more of a centrist candidate, uh, more progressive. And I think Alberta needs a more progressive centrist candidate. Then um, yeah, if everything goes right. or But on the other camp, then it could be the Todd Lowen. If Brian Jean and Danielle Smith say and do stupid things, maybe he's able to get exactly. enough support. But a lot of the a lot of things would have to go wrong for a lot of people, and a lot of things would have to go right for him for that to happen. And that's always my underdog story. A lot of things go wrong for a lot of people, and we might have Premier uh, Prime Minister Patrick Brown in a few week, months. Who knows? Who knows? We yeah. always talk about these things, Spencer. I, I know I threw you for your loop on the last question, but I want to thank you so much for sitting the last hour with us and talking about this because we're trying to gauge what people are talking about when it comes to this UCP leadership and your insights on the candidates uh, is so welcome on the show. So thank you so much for doing this. Thanks so much, Chris. So with that, I want to remind everyone uh, that get out from behind your good old social media for at least 10 minutes a day and go have a conversation with somebody. It does help our society and our democracy. And if you're a UCP member or if you're wanting to be a UCP BP member, you have until August 12th to sign up for the uh, race. And if you become a member, you can vote for the next premier of the province as well. So sometimes you say democracy doesn't work, but if you get involved, it does work. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.